What is up, best friends? Welcome to Weta, Weta Wednesday. I can't Weta, say Weta, Weta Wednesday because I want to say Weta. Well, when it's a Weta Wednesday, it is also, for many people, a Weta Wednesday. <laughs> Perfect. So you may have had it right first time. Let's go with that. We planned that in the script. Uh, I'm Fran, aka FM3 on Twitch. As you all may know, happy to be sitting here with Gary today. I've not had the opportunity to be on Weta Wednesday. Yeah, we were just talking earlier about um, this is the first time that we've hosted together, so this will be fun. Yeah, we're going to have a blast and yeah. lots of big news. Today, we're going to be discussing Borderlands 3 has a release date and more information out there. A new trailer, Anthem developers have cited uh, studio issues privately, but on the record with um, Jason Schreier over at Kotaku and Persona 5 was listed on sale for Switch. And there's a lot more, but first, a little bit of housekeeping here. Of course, as you probably know by now, this is kind of funny. Games Daily, and you can watch us each and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific time live right here on Twitch TV slash kind of funny games. If you are watching live, remember, you got a very special job. Head over to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong if we get stuff wrong. As I often repeat, uh, only keep it to if we're actually wrong because sometimes we get write-ins and it's hard to go through that stuff. Um, and if you don't watch live, remember that you can watch it later on youtube.com slash kindoffunny. Uh, yes, uh, youtube.com slash games, or you can listen on podcast services around the globe by searching for Kind of Funny Games Daily. Uh, and also, Kevin just pulled up as a reminder. Oh, this is Greg, live, Kevin. He's not going to be happy about this, is he? Look at the current look at the current standings. If you've been following Greg and Kind of Funny, ESPN underscore esports on Twitch has been having these polls. And uh, Greg is facing off against zero in the uh, round 16 of these polls. So head over to twitter.com slash ESPN underscore esports. And if you want, vote for Greggy. Right uh, now, he's losing forty nine percent. With four hours to go, Greg is losing forty nine to fifty one. So he needs uh, a last for minute God's surge. God's sake! So everyone, go and vote, and then retweet, <laughs> begging people to vote. We are not Beg above <laughs> begging. We are <laughs> not above beg beg. Is, beg Gre is Greg going to be un un unbearable if he doesn't win this it's thing? It's not that Greg. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be. He's going to be honored that he was even, you know, ranked this high. Yeah. But for <laughs> God's sakes, please go and vote and retweet. Why is this so important? Do it. You're making it sound like this is the it's end of the world. It's important to Greg. Every victory is important. It's not important to Greg. It's important to the company. Because it's what Kind of Funny stands for, which is it's a community that can do anything it sets its mind to. Right? right? Even, so Even if we, people are way, way bigger than us. That's right. So this is what that stands for. And Greg is at 49%. They're basically tied with almost 82,000 Yeah, votes. within so, the margin of error. But, you yeah. know, it, I mean, there's obviously there's no margin of error. There's because no margin of error exactly on Twitter. It's just 81, whatever you get. 81,143 <laughs> votes cast yeah. with four hours to go. And Greg is losing by two percentage points. That's got to so, be harsh. It's going to be a close call if you're over on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Game. Games, but maybe take the second and see if the poll is still live. Uh, I believe that the show will be up just as it's maybe coming to a close. Otherwise, check that out. Also, as a last note, to be a part of the show, of course, you can head to patreon.com slash kind of funny games where bronze members or above get to write in and silver members or above get the show ad free. All right. As you already know, today's big stories uh, I already covered off on that. And the last bit of housekeeping there's a meet and greet this Saturday. Gary, you're not going, are you? In uh, New York. That's right. You're not going, right? I'd love to. I love New York, but Me no, too. unfortunately I won't be there. Same sentiment. We got to we gotta hold down the fort here. But New York, you're on the clock at 3 p.m. at Ease Bar, Morningside Heights. Uh, head over there. Check out details at kindoffunny.com slash events. Right, Kevin? Uh, yep, that's, yep, that sounds totally right. You going to that, Kevin? <laughs> that sounds totally right. Kevin, uh, you going to be there? Unfortunately, I will not be there. Okay. We will have Cool Greg there and Joey Noel. Oh, cool. Brilliant. Yeah. Love them. Mm -hmm. Freaking fantastic. All right. So head over there. Make sure to sign up. Get there early. You know the drill. And have a lot of fun. And, uh, well, Gary and I will, will miss being there. Yeah. All right. As a last bit of thanks to our Patreon producers, Tom Bach, Blackjack, James Davis, and Muhammad Muhammad. Thank you very much for supporting us. And also supporting us, our sponsors, 23andMe and Skillshare. But I will tell you more about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. <laughs> it's time for some news. We have four stories today. A baker's dozen! Let's get into it, Gary. Allow, allow me to say, yes. uh, before we do get into it, typically... Uh, people who are familiar with Widow Wednesday have heard me complain uh, from time to time that I seem to have bad luck in coming in on what a, what a Wednesday just seems to be like a thin news day. Yeah, that's like sometimes Fran Friday. Good, sometimes Same it's good problem. stories, but sometimes it's like, I don't know, is this really what's happening yeah. today? Today, all big stories. So I'm excited. Yeah, it's funny to hear you say that because I'm sitting here 
coming in from Fran Friday. Fran Friday is no good either. No, because <laughs> it's exhausted. The gas tank is empty. It's taking the trash day Friday, That's right? <laughs> pretty much. I come in on trash day, and you get hump day. So we both. I don't know. We have the same problem. But today, lots of big news. We knew this was coming. In fact, there were already leaks about it. But Borderlands Three has a new release date. Right. There's a new trailer online, and. It's going to be an epic store exclusive for a period of time. Okay, so lots of angles on this one. Yeah, so let's just start with the the, the one that everybody wants to know about. Uh, this story I'm citing from Tamor Hussein over at GameSpot. Gearbox has confirmed that Borderlands 3 will launch on September 13th, 2019. As indicated by a leak earlier this week, it was true. They had pulled back on a tweet, I believe, that got leaked Yeah, they leaked put out. up a tweet and then deleted it. And they were like, it was funny because folks reached out for a comment and they were like, we just don't have a comment right now. Which you could tell, you're like, obviously that's the day, but we're just going to have to wait for their, they already had stuff in place for this, right, uh, right. this announcement. They had which, their rollout all planned. I can't totally blame them because they were like, you know, just let's wait a few more days, but here we it's go. I mean, I don't want to, it's interesting, why don't they stagger it? I mean, they're, they're massive rollout event at PAX, yeah. but then they hold off on the actual release date and some of the other details for a few days later. You know, Why uh, not just put it out there all at once? Yeah, you've seen companies just have their own rhythms and ways that they do things. Sometimes, right, it comes from the developer and this, the PR working together. Yeah. So I don't know whether it was 2K or them, but they've, they had PAX, they had a teaser before PAX, they had multiple things PAX, now they had this, this is also, though, it is timed right with the release date of Borderlands um, Game of the Year edition. Right. So I think that was the primary reason. But then apparently there's even more. I believe it's in the story that on May 1st, there's going to be a gameplay reveal. So they, they have a staggered rollout, okay. probably even leading into a round more at E3. But right. um, let's continue with some more details. As you all probably know by now, it's on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Um, and alongside this release date, there is a new trailer, as I mentioned, which confirms uh, at launch the game will be distributed through Epic. Game Store so this PC. Wasn't, this wasn't the trailer they showed at PAX East. This no, is this is brand new. new. Okay, another one. There was some recycled footage in there, but like overall, it's a really cool trailer. A okay. lot of fun. Okay, be sure to check it out. Um, but it's going to be on Epic's Game Store uh, exclusively, so not on Steam or any other services that we can tell. And that is going to be until April 2020. So about a, so about a year. Si uh, six months. Oh, no, sorry, about six months. Exactly, about half a year. I'm going from now. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. about six months. Yes, a year from now. Um, so that's a big get for the Epic Game Store. It is, man, and it left me thinking. Thinking, I was like, wow, like what is left right now on Steam side of things? There's obviously a ton of games on Steam and some some quality ones, but like a lot of these big upcoming hits are making it on Epic Store. And it's left me wondering, like, are they concerned? Are they structured to sort of fight back or are they weathering the storm? Well, like, isn't, it weird how, isn't it weird how PC is now kind of having its own version of the console wars with yeah. these different store platforms that are now in competition? It was used to be Steam ran the roost and I mean it's st it still obviously is the, the number one platform but Epic yeah. is coming on really strong oh, yeah. obviously EA will always um, be faithful to its own origin uh, platform we're seeing yes. other storefronts uh, Beth you know, Bethesda's got yeah. its own storefront Blizzard in a, uh, Ubisoft Activision's got its own, but Ubisoft all these different storefronts but that, which are, and those games and, and those storefronts are typically just for their own you know uh, first party titles yes um, but Epic is seems to be the one yeah. that is the most uh, emerging as most like yeah, they, a true competitor to Steam. Doesn't even have to be on the Unreal Engine, I guess, right? So, uh, not that I don't think Borderlands runs on that. Maybe. Why it do you does, think they actually, made a the decision? Is it just because Epic Games uh, are money. offering better terms? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, the big thing is, I forget if the cut is that Epic only takes 10% versus 30%. It's a better, of, I remember it's very aggressive. It's better than yeah, what Steam offers. Kind of funny.com slash you're wrong, whatever that number was. But it's way better. And so, financially, like every copy sold, uh, it's, it's a big deal. I should take this moment to both disclose and plug. I make money on the Epic Store, so take my feedback on the platform as you will. Of course, you also can support me if you decide to pre-order <laughs> Borderlands <laughs> by using code Fran Mirabella. That's why I love working with Kind of Funny because it, it, when I was at IGN, you got to be, I mean, you would disclose it, but you'd mostly be hands off on stories like this. Right. But truthfully, I'm happy to provide my commentary. How do you make money on the Epic them. Games Store? Oh, so it's a very small portion of revenue share on some games. So if you go ahead at no extra cost, you pre order, say, the $250 edition, then you, I get a small percentage. But oh, you have like a that. referral link or something? Yeah. Okay, I get uh, it. So you use the code Fran Mirabella over there. Um, All right. And you can get in there. And a lot All of right. kind of funny fans have been using it. Thank you. Seriously, it's a huge um, a step forward in supporting what I love doing here. But it is important disclosure. You do need to take the, you know, maybe take what I say with a grain of salt. 
That being said, I will say that the Epic Game Store has a long way to go. When you go into the store, man, you can't even alphabetize. <laughs> so oh, it's really? like the, the user experience is not great. It's it's just like a huge list of games because it went from like three to like you know Some hundred. The, now there's a ton whatever. on there, yeah. And then it's going to grow to a thousand. I have a feeling that an update's probably coming, but uh, but regardless, I mean, so they you, originally, I, I mean, they originally built that thing just to sell Fortnite, right? I mean, that's all uh, it was for. Sort of. I mean, it was used for some like mods and stuff when it comes to Unreal and whatnot, but. Um, but yeah. Do you, do you think it's going to emerge as a true competitor to Steam? Oh, yeah. Do you think Epic Game Store and Steam will end up being like the Xbox and PlayStation of the PC world? In I terms think of it's the on a platforms? very, very strong path right now. Um, if anyone's going to do it, it's these guys, right? Yes, and I say that because of just sort of the quality of um, like UI and experience that has been put into Fortnite, but also the fact that like Unreal Engine is so polished these days. They've yeah. got the resources. And they've got so they, many people coming there just through yeah. Fortnite. yeah. Um, and, you know, they've got the experience overall now on the marketing side and building stores and all that. I don't know if that's, you know, what they're building in terms of that. But no, like, uh, frankly, it's already on a pretty good path. But like any platform, it's very early. Steam, frankly, kills it with a lot of its features and, you know, searchability and all that stuff. But either way, the end of the day, you download Borderlands 3 and you can play it on there uh, up through April 2020 when presumably it'll head to Steam and maybe elsewhere. But importantly, back on Borderlands 3 info, in the trailer, uh, the gameplay uh, that was in there also introduces the Vault Hunter uh, players will take control. Sorry. Uh, the trailer is a show, this comes from Tamor again. The trailer is a showcase of Borderlands 3 gameplay and also introduces the Vault Hunter players will take control of as they hunt for loot, uh, the legendary vaults, and take on the fanatical Calypso twins. All right, here are the hunters. This is, sorry, that was the way it was worded was getting me. Among them is Moe's the Gunner, Amara the Siren, FL4K, the Beastmaster, and Zane, the Operative. So you do get a little bit closer of a look at these characters. Uh, Moses is able to summon a mech, which other players can mount. Amara can summon ethereal arms to brawl um, using FL4. No, this is weird. This is like this. This, this is, is weirdly a, written. It really is. I'm having trouble reading through. It's funny. I read the story, but uh, clearly I didn't say it out loud. So. Uh, Anyway, Amara can summon Ethereal Arms to brawl, and uh, F. Uh, who is this fourth one? FL4K. FL4K. Which I guess are you supposed to read that as Flak? Oh yeah, I guess it's Flak. Good, good lead speak. Just Flak, but this is weird. It says Flak controls beasts, as his class name implies. What does that mean? Does he uh, a, because it's Flack the Beastmaster. Oh, Flack the Beastmaster. Which Beast, was not oh, included right, okay, in that. Got one, it, yeah. got it, got it. Sorry, everybody. Uh, there was a lot of news today, actually, so I should have taken a little closer look at it. So Flack the Beastmaster controls Beast, as his name implies, and Zane is very handy. So those at are the four main enemies. character types that you can choose between. Okay. Yeah, the Vault Hunters. And, uh, you know, you can head over for more and check that out um, in the trailer. And then also the um, the Calypso twins are who you're going up against. So watch the trailer, check it out, and you can find more there. Are you excited? Are you a Borderlands person? No, I'm just getting into it. So Greg and I might be hopping on tonight. I understand that he's played a for lot. The, for the Game of the Year version? Yes. Okay. So Borderlands Game of the Year. I've never played it uh, at all. And you'd be surprised maybe given like all the looter, you know, shooter right. type games I play. It sort of set the standard and is beloved. It's sold something on the order of, uh, I think it's 40 million copies or something between all the franchise uh, sales. Yeah. And I, as I often say on the show, it was just a matter of time. I never really made enough time for it. And I sunk so much time into other games and I kind of regret it now. Well, this, However, is, this, is, this is your opportunity. I know. And actually, I was thinking it's a good parallel to also how I fell behind on the Avengers movies uh, and the whole Marvel Universe movies, I should say. But I'm in this unique position where I'm cramming everything in now, right? Watching it right before Endgame comes out. So it's all fresh. And when an event happens just months away in the storyline of these movies, I didn't have to wait years to see it. Um, I'm watching it compressed. And that's what I'm thinking about for Borderlands. I'm going to get to play these in succession. So what I'd say is if you missed Borderlands, it's a pretty cool opportunity to head over and like put all these together and lead up to Borderlands. I know right. that the games overall, they hold up pretty well. And there's one other big, there's a, I just saw at the bottom of the page, here, another yes. big aspect of Borderlands 3, which is very interesting to me because mm -hmm. this is a personal a subject that I um, have a lot of thoughts about. This yeah. is interesting. Yeah, do you the, uh, do you want to read it? Well, okay. Uh, oh, jeez, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I I'm, can't have you. Are. I'm, not, I'm not qualified to to uh, to host a tour. But let's see. Um, the headline is Borderlands Three supports cross platform co op, according to the Microsoft Store. Yes, uh, the listing for Borderlands Three on Microsoft Store page. So does that mean it would also be available on the Microsoft Store, not just on the Epic Store? Uh, 
That is probably just for the Xbox version, though. So oh, for PC, right, okay, yeah, 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 yeah of yeah, course, yeah. of course. So it's just for the uh, Xbox Claims that the game will support cross-platform co-op. So far in the game's short but loud marketing campaign, developer Gearbox has yet to say anything about cross-platform play. And yet here it is in black and white under the capabilities section of the Microsoft store listing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I was about to go here. It says, chances are it more likely refers to co-op play between PC and Xbox One, which is already right. a common feature for Microsoft. Yes, yeah, so like with Sea of Thieves, uh, you can just cross-play. Uh, Gears of War supports it, I believe Forza. So it's been a very common feature, but for first-party games. Um, so for this one, it could be, so we don't know yet. IGN says it reached out to Gearbox for comment. That's where I picked up this story. And hopefully it refers to cross-platform, but don't count on it yet because they've not confirmed it. But I thought it was an interesting note. That would be amazing and awesome and a huge strength, obviously, for the Xbox community. Just, you know, it is a co-op game. And so having that ability to cross-play would just be awesome and brilliant um but we don't know if that's really going to come yeah to and it makes sure sense as well because it. you know in competitive play there's always the argument about pc people have an advantage because they've got superior uh, yeah. technology and the mouse is more accurate and all that stuff in co-op though everyone's Doesn't on matter. the same team it's great yeah i mean you might have a little more trouble aiming on the console but yeah, other than that. yeah. I, I love console by the way people i think think i'm like a pc whore at this point and that's not uh that's not the case i do love mouse and keyboard for shooters but um, I've been playing Division 2 on console. You know, it's fine. You're you playing just... on PlayStation, right? Yep, Okay. on PS4. Oh, yeah, I know. We know this I too know, well because I, I see Gary's well. at the end game, as, as am I, We're and I wish we could play. We're both in the but we can't team up. Yeah, we I know. can't team up. It was this is the whole problem. I say it once again. I really wish they would solve it. I wish they could find a way for us to all play together. Like, a Division 2 is a great example. Like, half of my friends are on Xbox, half of my friends are on PlayStation. I had to make a choice, and I had to leave half of my friends yeah. out in the cold. If I'd have gone to PlayStation, I would have missed playing with my Xbox friends. Either way, I'm screwed. So yeah, I wish yep. they would find a way to get past Yeah, I mean, that. this is entirely the problem. Like, we're all way too familiar with it at this point. Sony is getting the brunt of the blame uh, where Xbox is out there. Phil Spencer has said many times, it's like, let's do it. Uh, and you see Xbox is sort of going anywhere. They're kind of taking that broader approach. I mean, how do you feel about cross-play? And like, does, do you think that it's understandable that PlayStation is still like, we're not going to allow it? Um, you know, where do you stand on the whole cross-play issue? Well, I guess, I guess they just, they just, I, I guess from Sony's point of view, they're in such a dominant position. I guess they're, I, I guess they think like, who cares? Like, we, we don't need it. Um, I just, I, I, from from a from a consumer perspective, like I said, all I know is whenever whenever a game comes out, a multiplayer game comes out on multiple platforms, I have to make a choice of who, which friends I'm going to play with and which friends are going to be left out in the yeah. cold. And I hate that. And exactly. I, I wish they could just whatever technical marketing problem. I wish they could just, everyone could just get around a table and say, look, this doesn't harm anybody. It makes it, it makes it better for consumers all around. Why don't we just all agree to make this work? Yeah, and it's better for everyone. So yep. I understand there are technical challenges, but just fucking sort them out because I'm for tired of having to choose which friends I get to play with. It, exactly. I mean, I figured you'd fall into the same uh, sort of obvious camp, which is like, why do we have to keep putting up with this? Um, we remember at the Game Awards, they got on stage, uh, what was it, Reggie uh, yeah. at the time, and uh, was it Sean Layden? Right, yeah, and, they had all uh, the big Phil. boys up there. Yeah, they all got up and said, You're, we're committed to a brighter future. <laughs> it was like... Work together. It, it was sort of like, all right, we'll get up there and just sort of have a positive message for gaming, but that nobody really like committed 100% to do it. And Fortnite it. has shown that it is possible. It is. Many developers talk about it's a flick of the switch. Now, it's never quite that, but frankly, we're led to believe I think a lot of times that it's very complicated, but Company, they're, they're the I mean, same com you know, companies need to, you know, the, the the people at Microsoft and PlayStation just basically need. It's less to do with the technical problem, which I'm sure I'm not an expert, but I'm sure it's solvable. Yeah. It's more to do with the companies having the political will to do it. They've got to decide oh, yeah. if it's something they want to do. It's. I mean, I hate to keep throwing them under the bus, but truthfully, it does seem that Sony is one of the bigger, biggest blockers. Like they're just they're. They're styming everybody by saying we're just not interested in discussing it. I mean, they say they are, but everybody who's sort of a plot applied to discuss it does not really get responses from Sony. You see, as, as long as Sony's in a market leading position, yeah, they, 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 it's they not are. in their interest. May, maybe not le, less in their interest than say Microsoft's interest to open those doors up. Because one of the arguments they can make is, well, hey, in the market for a console, you should buy a PlayStation because most of your friends yeah. are on PlayStation most likely because we've sold many more consoles. If if the cross play uh, issue were to happen and everyone and, and everyone could play with everyone that's one less argument that Sony gets to make yeah maybe maybe that's yeah. the way they look at it I don't know maybe so I hope this story comes true the more I think about it wouldn't that be amazing and really show how committed Microsoft is is if it's selling on Epic Store it's not available on the PC Xbox Store for PC which they do all the time I guess but still it's not available 
And it's available, of course, on Xbox. And they say, you know what? You can crossplay. Like, yeah, that's exactly what we need right now. So I it's, fully, it's, I, it's, I, it's I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think this rumor is true, and I think there will <laughs> be PC Xbox crossplay because again, there's no technical barrier to it. We know they can do it. Uh, it's a major title. It's in Microsoft's interest. It's it's part of their overall strategy, the whole play anywhere thing. Yes. Um, I think they will do it. I think you'll see. I think you will see it Xbox. Would- and PC uh, Borderlands, Borderlands 3 players playing yeah, together. Huge. I'm getting like tingles thinking about it. You just, <laughs> seriously, like we really need it. Uh, and that, like, if I could play on PC and play with you, that would just be incredible. Well, I think um, everybody wants to see those walls come down. I'm surprised every time I get, because I've, I've spoken about this cross play issue on the show before. And every time it comes up, I always see a bunch of people in the comments saying, eh, who cares about cross play? And I don't understand why. I don't know. Like, what, don't you want, don't you want to have more friends to play with? Yeah. Why, why, yeah. why would you support that kind of segregation? Yeah, I think that when people say that, one, they actually forget about just plain old matchmaking. Like having a bigger pool to matchmake from is right, going to exactly. be a better thing. But two, of course, like maybe you don't have friends that are on other platforms, but a lot of other people do. And so it's huge for those two reasons alone. Um, it, sh- it should be the standard. So, all right, let's move on to the next story. This is uh, a big one, this next one. Oh, man. It is literally a big story. This was the, this was the, <laughs> this is the biggest story, story yesterday. Yes. It's huge. One of the biggest stories of the year. Obviously, Anthem has seen a troubled release. Critics sort of uh, caught in the middle of what was it supposed to be. Something feels kind of there, but not, um, you know, somewhere in the five to six Have range. Have you been playing Anthem at all? Yeah, I mean, what's, not what's really been, recently. What's but been your own experience with it? Is it? I actually the, reviewed it. Uh, yeah, oh, I ended okay. up doing a review. It's my first YouTube review that I've done. Okay. Um, but anyway, I landed on a 6.8 out of 10 was my okay. review. I, I kept my old standard of reviews that I okay. did many years at IGN. Um, but yeah, I said it has potential, uh, which was interesting in the story. They talk about the studio apparently felt that way too. Um, the short did, did, version did it, was... But did it feel to you like something that was oh, kind of yeah. half-baked? I, it's, 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 it's somewhat... It's a lot of reviewers are, are reading this report and we'll get into it. Uh, some 19 uh, sources that Jason Trier over at Kotaku had saying that it had all sort of studio issues and morale issues um, and direction issues. Uh, but there's a lot of reviewers out there, I think, who are like, I knew I knew something was off. And oh, that, yeah. That's what I felt. I mean, yes, it's sort of obvious. I think given your reaction, like, well, yeah, something was off. But it's not. I still stand by like it's not a bad game people came out this end of like it's bad it's not like 100 percent bad it's that it is misdirected and that there's these pieces that feel half baked so that's why a lot of people end up in the middle and i'm like i love the flying and i actually love uh one of the strongholds in particular i'm like this is what we want and you read through the story and you realize that's what apparently was happening at the studio they had these pieces that kept shape shifting and directions that were just all over. So let's let's get into it. Get here's, into the nitty gritty. Here's what I'm going to do on this. The story is huge. So head over to Kotaku.com uh, and you can pause. This yeah, the, f- you the, want, f- the first, first thing I, the first thing that I would recommend that people do is go read the story because yeah, it is a but, fantastic piece of journalism and a very very interesting yeah. read. Or like make, you said, it's a really long piece, but I was riveted the whole way through. I read uh, the whole thing exactly. But you know, I can still sum it. Well, let's sum it the, first uh, uh, before you leave the show and head over there. But. Um, <laughs> But so there's been a lot of Anthem developers on the record, at least uh, not by name, but anonymously with Jason Schreier. So he said 19 current and former Bioware uh, employees were were, uh, were uh, Jason spoke to. That's a, yeah. that's a lot of sources. So yeah, what since the story's so long and you read a ton of it, I read a ton of it. I probably won't read every detail, but let me read the sure. opening lines here that I thought were interesting. Fans have speculated endlessly how to Anthem went so awry. Was it originally a single-player role-playing game like Bioware's previous titles? Did EA force Bioware to make a Destiny clone? Did they strip out all the good missions to sell later as DLC? Is the loot system secretly driven by an elaborate AI system that huh. keeps track of everything you do so you can uh, spend more money in the game and in the store? The answer to all those questions is no. So I thought that opening was really actually succinct. There's a lot of conspiracy theories of the the men with the black hats and the alleyways that are out there um, sort of yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the conspiracy theories that that um, that surrounded the game when it first came out, and obviously it had, had a very troubled release. Yep. Uh, while not true, the actual story behind why why the game uh, has struggled is just as fascinating. Yes. 
So let me read just this one short paragraph, and then I think we just dive, just dive in. into it. Uh, so one of the paragraphs here was perhaps the most al- alarming about Anthem is it's a story about a studio in crisis. Dozens of developers, many of them decade-long veterans, have left Bioware over the past two years. Some who have worked at Bioware's longest-running office in Edmonton talk about depression and anxiety. Many say their co-workers had to take a stress leave, quote, um, and a doctor-mandated period of weeks or even months worth of vacation for their mental health. One former Bioware developer told uh, Jason that they would frequently find a private room in the office, shut the door, and just cry. People were so, uh, this is a quote, people were so angry and sad all the time. Another one said, depression and anxiety are an epidemic within Bioware. So this was like, I feel like the heart of how bad it got, but there's a ton more info. I mean, so, it, feel, it feels like as much a story about the development, there's a story about the, the development of a troubled project, but also a bigger story about, a kind of more existential story about a studio in crisis and 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 the, the problems that are often endemic to building these massive, massive games and the human cost in terms of crunch yes. and emotional, uh, you know, what, what's, what, what's the emotional psychological cost of being, of, of working every hour God sends on a game that yeah. no one knows. The, the, the problem seems to be, uh, there was a number of problems, technical issues, but the biggest, the biggest, if you ask me to kind of dissect this article and come up with yeah, what, what did you glean away, was the overview. Lack of direction mm-hmm. for the longest time. You know, Casey Hudson, who was a senior figure at Bioware, um, and I believe was the guy that kind of originally said, hey, let's make this game, which at the time was called yeah. Beyond, and eventually uh, became yes, known as it Anthem. it was codenamed, or no, it was going to be called Beyond. Dylan. Well, Dylan was the and code was name. Co- they were going to release Dylan, it as yeah. Beyond. They couldn't get clearances for it, so they came up with Anthem Right instead. before E3. Yeah. And everyone was like, why are we calling it Anthem? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, they named it something they didn't even know before the E3 reveal. Like, that's how sort of uh, crazy the ride has been. The, bigger, the biggest, most existential problem that, that emerged from the article that I could tell was that nobody seemed to know for the longest, longest time what the what game was they were even making like what's the vision yeah. uh, are, are we flying around are we not there were versions where they were flying versions where they were not climbing flying. mountains was the, like the, the mission the structure kept changing and no, it seemed like nobody in senior management was capable of making a decision like so at some point somebody you know you have you have a big meeting they described a lot they said one a very common type of meeting was everyone would get together talk about missions talk about flying talk about game design talk about narrative talk about mythology talk about all these key issues and then at the end of the meeting nothing would be decided and the meeting would just break up and no one was any the wiser yeah where at some point someone's got to say a person in, in authority has got to say this is the vision this, this is, is what the direction, we're doing. this is the game we're making yeah, yeah. we're not climbing and that mountains didn't happen we're going until to make about, a jet set game and that but. didn't happen until about a year before launch it was only with about a year to go for a game that was in development for six or seven years only with only within like the last 12 to 14 months did they know what they were doing which is crazy yeah yeah i think that's a a pretty good summation of what happened was a lot of it seemed to be spending a bunch of time prototyping there was general excitement about what it could be before it was even called anthem and the whole concept that that i can see there's a spark of it but certainly it's been lost was that you would you know, go out on a mission and they want to pull levers. That's where we're still waiting and, and seeing if they're going to pull these live weather server levers and stuff. But they, what they wanted to do was create a game where you would go out into the world and suddenly, boom, you get sacked with a snowstorm. You're in the middle of a blizzard with your team and you're going into the heart of whatever, a volcano. And you get in there, you fight those enemies and you try to make it back. And you're just trying to survive. And you're right? trying that to survive as a team. And that's what apparently was the hook that everybody was Which excited Which sounds about. great. I would, I would have signed on it's for that. Elevator pitch. Yeah, and the whole team did. They were excited about it. As it started to evolve and they started to prototype and that's where, as you talk about it, and allegedly, but they say they got trapped in meetings and well, decisions these, were made. And, and they talked about these key moments where like, they finally delivered a build of the game to Patrick Soderlund, who at the time was a very senior figure at EA. Uh, kind of like a, a gone, godlike, by the way. A, a kind of, a, own studio. Yeah, a kind of a godlike figure. Um, and they showed him the build, and he said, I don't like this. Do something. Back to the drawing board. Yeah. And so they had to go back and completely, completely reinvent the game. And I think at that point, they put flying back in. And again, it's a, okay, so the best thing to do is, re, it's a fast, Jason did a great Great job. It's brilliantly written, brilliantly researched. A trem- I would say this. Kudos to Jason Schreier for what is, I think, one of the better pieces of like investigative journalism oh, yeah. in gaming that I've read in a really, really long time. Fascinating piece. So anyone who's worked on a big... I tweeted about this yesterday. Anyone who's worked on a big, troubled project mm-hmm. reads this and finds it very harrowing, but also very relatable because we've all yeah. been there where, you know, people keep moving the goalposts and are we making this or are we making that? And it's, it's, it's not uncommon 
Uh, I think that I, I imagine that yesterday when this story broke, developers at every major studio in the in the business read this and went, "I recognize that. I recognize that. I recognize yeah. that." You know, m- mismanagement from the top, lack of vision, lack of direction. Nobody wants to make a decision. We keep getting the people keep moving the goalposts. We we don't know what we're doing. Um, it's it's not uncommon. It's just what happened here is a combination of a very 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 high profile example of it because it was a big launch from a major developer, and it's now been very very. Um, uh, forensically dissected for all to see. Yeah, and there's you know there are updates coming still. Uh, yeah. We're waiting on a new stronghold to be released. Uh, their big raid like event is supposed to come out in May. I mean, right. I really hope they hit these marks. But maybe going back to that for just a second, um, have you been part of big projects that have you know you felt were like super troubled and like who? Yeah, do you blame? I mean, I work I work in Hollywood, yeah, so exactly. yeah. I mean, <laughs> hint hint. I was just I, like, I, I, don't I know, share maybe. A yeah, little. I'm not I'm not going to go into into any details. I've worked on a bu- I've worked on a bunch of projects like this where you know big studio movie and there's so much money on the line. There's a lot of risk aversion. People are afraid to make a mistake, mm-hmm. and it leads to a kind of paralysis where people don't want to make a decision. Uh, I've seen I've seen that happen who, many times. Who do you blame though? Can you blame anyone? Is it the sort of top? Executives? It always comes from the top. It, you, it is their fault because they didn't set the course. Is that yeah, absolutely. Say, and 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 Jason's piece is a perfect perfect example of that. If you look at. Uh, the, you know, look at those 19 different sources that all gave quotes. They all tell, like, like, like this isn't made up. 19 different people all told the same story. Mm-hmm. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet. And that was, <laughs> um, people wouldn't make a decision. Like I said, the, 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 Jason says in the story that one of the, one of the more common anecdotes that he heard was these epic meetings where people would get together to talk about some major issue they and, the meeting, would, for and the meeting would break up without any resolution. Yeah. And so, and no, and no one comes away with any more clarity on what the vision for the game is yeah. than when they went in. Um, and you know, an, another another big uh, piece of this that emerged, which I thought was fascinating, was the problems that they have with the Frostbite engine. Yes, uh, really, really interesting. So you know, when EA bought Dice. One of the big company-wide decisions they made was, well, we're going to take the Frostbite engine, and that's essentially going to be our in. That's going to be our in-company Unreal or Unity or whatever. These, this, this is the development yeah, tool that everyone's wanna, going to use. They don't FIFA pay uses Epic. it like all the EA games. Essentially, I think I'm sure there are yeah. some examples, but all of the big EA games are developed from the Frostbite. Yeah, engine. mandated. You need to use Frostbite. So get it was, on, get with the program. So it was mandated, and, and I understand the point of that. Like you know, you don't have to pay for a licensing fee for Unreal or anything. Sense. You save a lot of money in you theory. Have, and you can sh- you can share knowledge between different studios because they're all they're all on the same page in terms of the, the technology and the tools they're using. But in in, in but you know an, an engine is not necessarily always um, a Swiss Army knife for any kind of project that you want to yeah, do. Yeah, because it was developed for dice for Battlefield. Right, I mean and that's now, what and, it's for. And they and you know the whole the whole point of Anthem was built around the idea you can fly around in these Iron Man type suits. As they as again as the article points out, many developers said the Frostbite engine was just not suitable for the kind of game they wanted to make. So it took them way way longer to think if they were developing the game on Unreal or some tool that they had built specifically for the development of Anthem. Yeah, things that would have taken maybe an hour were taking days. Yeah, and that was killing them. Yeah, apparently it led to so much frustration. And like that is something that I have seen happen a lot is that when you end up on an engine and we even heard tales that you know Bungie although it created its own stuff ended up in a similar situation with Destiny they created this engine that couldn't quite support the vision and then it would take forever to work through issues and so that becomes a for designers then it becomes a frustration just to get anything done um, what I thought was really interesting though that uh, you know if true there was a note in there about how the team got assigned to FIFA, the team right. that was very familiar with Frostbite, according to the report, for a period of time, because that was the biggest game, uh, makes so much revenue, so they said, you know what, we need you to spend your time on that. So that's where you do get a little bit into corporate overlord decisions. That's one of the problems like, with working at a major company like EA, where yeah, you've got all these they strip working resources. different games. They had a bunch of people working on Anthem that were probably the most... Um, uh, familiar and the most expert at using Frostbite, uh, but suddenly FIFA needs those people because yeah. FIFA's so a massive franchise. So they, they lose those people, and they're exactly. struggling even more. And and round and round it goes. And um, I just thought, I, I, I in reading this, again, as, as fascinating as I thought it was, I it, the article just made me feel really sad because I felt, I, I really feel for these developers. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have some questions at the end of the show that I think we can get into that um, a bit more. Do you want to talk about BioWare's somewhat tone-deaf response as Perfect well to all of this? segue. So, BioWare, uh, it ruffled their feathers so much that they felt compelled to actually make a statement. You normally don't see this, but, you know, with 19 sources, um, they felt compelled to make a response. Which so they I, put out without even reading Jason's article. Did you notice that? It came out like right as the article came out. 
I think what happened was Jason Jason went, said Jason it's publishing. In, I think Jason, in doing his well, due diligence, went to EA and Bioware and said, "Hey, we're running this story. Do you have a comment?" And this is what they did. Good point. We don't know what Jason sent them, though, right? The detail of right. probably. I don't know if he would have sent them the whole story. No. I well, he said he, reporter, Jason said that that I would have they, told they, them. That, that they made that statement without having read the article. Interesting. So yeah, I guess he knows that they came out with it so fast. Well, right. that I did not know that. So that's. Something else. He obviously had told them we've got a bunch of people saying that morale was terrible, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So here's what Bioware, Bioware had to say. I do want to read this full thing. Um, Bioware posted, we'd like to take a moment to address an article published this morning, this was yesterday, about Bioware and Anthem's development. First and foremost, we wholeheartedly stand behind every current and former member of our team that worked on the game, including leadership. It takes a massive amount of effort, energy, and dedication to make any game, and making Anthem would not have been possible without every single one of their efforts. We chose to not comment or participate in this story because we felt there was an unfair focus on specific team members and leaders who did their absolute best to bring this totally new idea to fans. Uh, we didn't want to be part of something that was attempting to bring them down as individuals. We respect them all, and we built this game as a team. We put a great emphasis on our workplace culture in our studios. The health and well-being of our team members is something we take very seriously. We have built a new leadership team over the past couple years, starting with Casey Hudson as our general manager in 2017, which has helped us make big steps to improve studio culture and our creative focus. We hear the criticisms that were raised by the people in the piece today, and we're looking at the and we're looking at that alongside feedback that we receive in our internal team surveys. We put a lot of focus on better planning to avoid quote unquote crunch time, and it was not a major topic of feedback in our internal postmortems. Making games, especially new IP, will always be one of the hardest entertainment challenges. We do everything we can to try and make it healthy and stress free. But we also know there is always room to improve. As a studio and team, we accept all criticisms that will come our way for all games we make, especially from our players. The creative process is often difficult. The struggles and challenges of making games are very real, but the reward of putting something we created into the hands of our players is amazing. People in this industry put so much passion and energy into making something fun. We don't see the value in tearing down one another or one another's work. We don't believe articles that we don't believe articles that, that do, do that, are that our are, there's a comma missing there in my right. opinion. We don't believe articles that do that are making our industry better and uh, in craft better uh, work. Sorry, I can't read today apparently. Our full focus is on our players and continuing to make Anthem everything it can be for our community. Thank you to our fans for your support. We do, um, we do what we do for you. So, so this is a classic example of, of, of uh, you know, a little bit of PR crisis management, which seemed to actually make the situation worse because this statement has not been well received. Yeah, as well, especially Jason apparently saying, it was like, I know they couldn't have read all that because, right. as you know, it takes like an hour to read that. Uh, you seem to be confirming that he didn't send well, it. Well, it takes an hour. It would take an hour just to read the article. Yeah. And then at some and point, he didn't gotta, send it to them. You, no one, people don't bash this out. You sit around in a room and say, like, what's the statement going to be? And the Yo, statement has yeah. to be approved so they, by senior people. It takes yeah. a while to put this stuff yeah, together. Yeah, for all we know, it was 24 hours. It was right. overnight. That's normally what I would say right. I've seen. Yeah. He probably sent it the night before or whatever. Yeah. Uh, give them a little bit of so time. So this, this was written, I think, without having read the article, but knowing enough about it and anticipating what the tone was going to be to put together. Because you notice this is a very general. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't address specific Yeah, um, I'd be curious things. what Jason sent them. Uh, he's usually pretty transparent about stuff like that. It'd be cool if he, I don't know if he's already said so, but if we knew what he said. Either way, what I can read into this uh, is, yes, they're, they're trying to cite internal team surveys as, wait, this doesn't line up. And yes, you have people talking about uh, being in a room and being depressed and crying. Like, yes, frankly, you are hearing from some of the people that maybe had it worse, but we don't know what all 19 sources were like and what they're composed of. 19 is a lot. It's not a small number. It'd be different if it was like two or three people. Right. And you'd be like, these were the angry people that didn't have a good time. And maybe there's some cringe that, but like, it's hard to get a full scope of measure, but this is 19 people. So it is quite a few. Um, and I think a lot of it lines up with what we're seeing. But, you know, when they take a team survey and they said, well, that doesn't add up. What I can say is I've seen big company team surveys and unfortunately you know they're just not a perfect system they they do sometimes bury um the exact data because everything gets boiled down to some average 
And you know, when you have people that, that maybe weren't as core to maybe the experience or whatever it was, like voting highly and so on, like it can get diluted. So I feel like maybe they have not heard honestly enough. And well, I'll be honest too, in surveys like this, sometimes you get people worried that frankly, those submission forms are not as anonymous as you think. And so right. you have employees that are worried. So like, who knows how, how the survey went, but they did cite it here saying everything's not quite the same, but who knows, maybe they're not hearing the true story internally yet. I mean, it seems a little bit like, I mean, the statement does strike me as a little bit defensive, which I guess is part of its its job is to put their side and defend themselves. Uh, the part that got highlighted uh, I, I, uh, by Jason when, uh, when he responded to this was, um, this whole business of uh, we don't see the value in tearing down one another and others work. We don't believe mm -hmm. articles that do that are making our industry craft better. So they're kind of accusing the article of having some kind of malicious intent yeah. or being kind of a hit piece. I didn't get that sense No, from it. I get the opposite, which right is, I think, we're on the I, same I side. felt like it was shining a, a light on... It, 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 How challenging and I, it is. And I didn't come away thinking like anyone in particular was the villain, right? It wasn't like this. It was this guy's fault or that guy's fault. Yeah. It does seem that in general, because again, the problems are, the problems always come from the top. It's the, the, the people on, you know, on, in the trenches are looking to the people above them for vision yeah. and guidance and direction. The generals, and if they're the not getting that, there's the nothing they can do. Right. But, but that is who the article's pointing to. So maybe right. that's where the statement's coming from. And it right. probably is. They're feeling obviously attacked. They're like, wait, like I thought we, we didn't, they're probably sitting there, well, I didn't sit in the room and do nothing, you know? Uh, there's more to the story, and so maybe this is the side that we're getting back, unfortunately. And that's why part of me believes that they're not hearing fully and honestly from their team, because it was really hard, and especially now even, like it's sort of spilled milk, like what do you do at this point? Like, um, do you put your job in jeopardy by saying, yeah, it really sucked, I don't like this creative director? Um, so I don't know. What well, I think some people that have, a, if you is. have a terrible time on a game and you have an opportunity, to get, a journalist comes along and gives you an opportunity to vent, you might well take it, which is why exactly. Jason obviously had no shortage of sources for this piece. Yeah. And you can see the passion was there. The spark was there. They, they said they believed it in the beginning. In fact, they were very excited. So maybe that's, that's the, that is why it's an interesting story. They were very invested in it and there was something there, um, something I still sense within it, even though it didn't come out right. And so I think that yeah, is the value this, of this story. I'm a, and I'm actually very, so for someone who's worked on both sides of the fence, you know, I used to be a journalist. Now I work on the creative side, making the things that get criticized and other yeah. subjects of journalism um you know like rogue one had its problems in mm -hmm. development and you know we saw a lot of coverage of that and i sat there reading a lot of it going this uh, this is not accurate that's not what actually and i'm not in a right. position to go away and rebut it but like i'm sitting there going like these guys don't know what they're taught they weren't in the room they don't know what really yeah. happened um but for the most part i read the article and first of all it, first of all it tracked doesn't the article tracks perfectly with the experience that game players have been having right yeah you see the problems in the game you read the article yeah i totally see how up. this led to that that the, this troubled development could have resulted in the game that actually released it all tracks it all makes sense um but again i i feel like this i i do feel like this was a worthwhile story i don't think it necessarily villainized anyone in particular i think that like i said beyond, you got to look at this beyond just the story of anthem anthem is one very very high profile example of this but it is maybe i think worthwhile looking at the story um, as a as a as a broader example of this is what it, this is what it's often like making AAA games at a major major studio. Yeah. These are the problems. It's not it, it's not like a Willy Wonka chocolate factory making these games where everyone's <laughs> having a wonderful time. Yeah. it's not a fun it's factory. It's really fucking work. hard. And there's politics yeah. and there's division and there's 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 personal there's tough personality choices, clashes you know, yeah. and there's huge billions of dollars on the line and shareholders are demanding. You know, one of the problems they had was they had to release. Really, it's mentioned many times in the article. The game had to be released before the end of the financial year yeah. uh, 2019 yeah. Which, and so you know even though they would I'm sure the developers at Bioware if EA said look when do you want to release it they would have said give us another six yeah, months or a year and then it would have then it'll sing. But no 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 you've got to release yeah. it now because our shareholders demand yeah. you know some well, kind of performance and to be fair it had been in pre-production since whatever 2012 or right. so like even though it didn't in earnest start hitting its stride till whatever it was 20 you know 15 16 but anyway lots of detail in that story again Kudos to Jason Trier, awesome reporting. Check out the article, uh, it's a great piece. And that is the highlight. I don't think it tears down no, the team that. that's there. I think there's a story to be learned, which is how can you get this feedback sooner? How can you make decisions sooner maybe? Um, obviously that's a story that developer through many decade, developers of many decades could tell you like it's not as easy. That's like a forehead comment. Do you think that Anthem will eventually come good in the way that Destiny, like it's, well, it's, it's, it's become quite a, t a, a typical story now, hasn't it? Like Destiny, Diablo 3, all these games. Yeah, Division, like they a, have trouble Division, launches. They lo Division 2 has actually had a very, is actually in better shape than yeah, most now. of these live games. Um, but typically, like Destiny is a great example, right? It launched, 
it had a lot of problems, but then after about a year with yeah. the expansion, they got, got into a good it, place. Though. Do you think Anthem will eventually end up in a good place? It's hard to say after reading the story, but I, I really would judge the next few months. I would have a better answer after that. But uh, again, I think we might I, have some questions at the, the end one, of the show. The one addresses. positive thing about it is I understand that, it, that, that it's, despite all its problems, mm -hmm. it sold very, very, very well. And so the fact that it's shifted so many copies and has so many players, I don't know how many people are still playing, but yeah. they sold I, a lot of copies, incentivizes EA to not just abandon this game. I, like, I think they have to continue. It's interesting, isn't it? There's like, they we, said they're sticking with it. I mean, they have players. They have to. You can't content. abandon this game. I mean, they have uh, episodes that are coming. So. Right. But let's, let's, there's so much detail on Anthem. I do want to you know, move on to some of the next stories. We might have some questions about Anthem okay. towards the end anyway. You could talk about um, Anthem all day. It's just so interesting. Oh, I, you know the Franthem. I'm all the about Franthem. it. And that's where we've gone with today's show. So that's, throw all your hands up. Franthem. That's, that's right. I love it. Uh, so let, let's move on to this one. It's really big. And I know okay. it'll hit this home is a, with you. This is a big one. There's for been sure. a leak today and uh, hopefully no new developments in the past, you know, 45 minutes. But uh, Persona 5 may have been inadvertently confirmed for Switch. Of course, there was a teaser the other day for this PS4. Um, or Persona wait. 5 S? Yes. Uh, this website that was up, but here's the story. This is by Matt Perslow over at IGN. U.S. retailer Best Buy has listed a Switch release of Persona 5, as well as a Metroid Prime trilogy and The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, only its internal, uh, on its only internal. on its internal staff only database, according to leaks on Twitter. And then photographs of computer screens displaying the database are the source of the leak, which images were uh, uh, were posted by user Gru731 on Imager and then spread across Twitter by Mystic, uh, Mystic Distance on Twitter, um, a translator who specializes in Persona. The image was then corroborated by Wario64, who you've heard many times on this show. And uh, Wario64 went on to upload mobile screenshots from Best Buy System showing listings for Metroid Prime Trilogy and Zelda A Link to the Past. So it's a large leak, but one that should be approached with caution. Persona 5 coming to Switch has long been rumored. And then there's this teaser so, Gary, what do you make of all this? I think I think Persona Five. I know that Barrett's got to get involved. You mentioned Persona. It's a subject yeah. close to his heart. Well, let's go to Barrett first because I, I know this is a big deal for you. What do, what do you make of all this? I, I I apologize to the audience for the last uh, couple months of my employment here, where I have been a naysayer of Persona Five coming to Switch. Yeah. Um, Don't you so, feel? Oh, you didn't think now. it was going to happen. Yeah, tell yeah, it, Barrett. I was convinced it was. Are you ready oh, to eat your hat yet? Uh, now you know who to you, trust. I, I've eaten my words, as okay. they say. Um, but I was convinced that Sony was not going to play ball, but it, uh, it makes sense for something like this to happen, especially if what we expect the, the Royal to be is kind of like, um, kind of like a Persona 4 Golden situation. It makes sense if Sony would let, uh, an exclusive title go over to a different console if that title wasn't like the best version out, right? So if the Royal is kind of like the, the better version of Persona 5, mm -hmm. like, and then they let per the regular Persona 5 go to Switch, like... I'm I'm so in. So you okay. feel like this is pretty much all but confirmed now? Like it's going to yeah. happen? Oh yeah. Okay. The, the, yeah, the, the, like, when Warrior 64 was corroborated with people, I was like, oh, this is for real. So I'm all excited. Right. And so, uh, Metroid Prime Trilogy has been rumored for a Yeah, let's for talk about the real time. story here, right. people. <laughs> Persona 5, we all love it. Metroid Prime, one of the greatest games of all time. And now, the chance that you can finally play the trilogy on Switch, that has got me excited. I don't want to move on too fast from Persona. I reviewed the original Metroid Prime. It is one of the all-time greats. It's one of the uh, just best-paced games. It was from an all-star team at Retro Studios. So, anyway... I. I'm excited about that one. Again, take it with a grain of salt. I mean, things like this are fabricated every that was, day. Was it on the Wii? All it took was a fake screenshot to get you convinced. Was Metroid I, Prime I originally it. a Wii title? Uh, what's that? Was it Wii? Metroid Prime? No, it was GameCube. That's oh, how Ga far oh, back. Wow. 2003. Okay. Holy shit. That's how far back this goes. But you remember on Wii, we actually got the trilogy and right. released. I think, uh, oh wait, was that Wii U? But anyway, uh, it went on to, you know, uh, span across the consoles. Well, that's exciting. We haven't the, seen it forever. The thing about Persona 5, it'd be nice to see it on Switch you know, it kind of takes. It does kind of harken back to Persona 4 Golden, playing on a handheld, and that's cool. And it's it, you know, Persona 5 is such an amazing game that the more people that get to play it, the better. Right. But it sounds like it will probably just be a straight port, right? I imagine probably. So, like I imagine with a whatever deal Atlas was able to make with Sony, because you you know Sony was probably trying to hold on Persona 5 only being on PS4. Yeah, I would imagine whatever the Switch version is, it's just a straight port of uh, the original game. And then, you know, Sony gets to keep the, uh, whatever, the Persona 5 Royal. Uh, or what do we Royal know about edition. that? Is that some kind of special edition? We we haven't seen much. There was, like, kind of a yeah. teaser trailer with more info coming later this month. So we don't, don't know if it's an expansion or if it's, like, a new... Um, 
new content coming to the original game. We, we're not too sure yet. So. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. Like I, I mostly agree with what you're saying, which is I'm sure that it's based largely on the stuff that's there. I mean, maybe there'll be some updates, but I don't think like the game has been out for a while now. Like yeah. exclusives generally are only about a year or so. I mean, who's to say what Sony did I mean, with it? But just just to give context, though, like modern day person main. Persona titles never leave Sony consoles, though. Like that. Like yeah, Persona but that may have just been an Atlas, Atlas sales choice, not a Sony pay for mm. or license. But mm. regardless, I think we can now say we firmly believe yeah. that it's coming to Switch. I coming mean, I've, the Switch. I've said for a long time with the fact that you know uh, what Joker's coming to Smash. Yeah. Like it's something's been happening, so I always believed it. Uh, we just want to know what the date is. So what? April twenty fifth, I think, is this now? When we're getting more info. That's more it's info. More information of this will be P5, revealed on April twenty fifth. Yeah, it's yeah. this P five S teaser thing that went up. Apparently so we don't know. We're getting more info on the Royal on the twenty fourth, uh, which is uh. like the first day of their con Persona concert in Japan, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the twenty. Fifth, we're getting more info on whatever Persona Five S, which is probably the Switch version. Okay, so exciting news! Um, well, Metroid Prime on Switch would be a big deal. Let's see if you're going all the way back to GameCube, huge. that would be a significant graphical upgrade. I mean, it Switch. could be. Yeah, well, they had already, like I said, they did uh, the trilogy on. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Wii because if it was available on Wii U, I would have played it. The trilogy, yeah, it must have been Wii it. then. I was just trying to remember which one it came on, but yeah. I mean, we barely lasted. Wii U barely lasted for three years or whatever. But um, regardless, uh, I think it would be a good conversion. But uh, it'll be exciting because we're now waiting on Metroid Prime, the next installment for which has now been sort of pushed back and put in the hands of a new developer. Yeah. So the most interesting one I I actually think is Link to the Past. That, that yeah, that's right. I'm glancing over that, but yeah. it's again, it's just sort of thrown in the system. It's hard to be sure of all of these things and when right. and where. But like, frankly, what can I they really do with that because you're going all the way back to the Super Nintendo. Do you think it's just going to be the Super Nintendo game? Yeah, that's the weird question is like, is this like them planning to do like add Super Nintendo support to their online system? Is this them possibly doing a remaster like they're doing to Link's Awakening? Is this just like them selling the original game? I on Switch, it, it, there's a couple of different questions we, we have there, and I think it's, that's why it's the most interesting one, because like, what's the, the, I don't yeah, know. That, that one stands out as weird to me because of the announcement of uh, Link's Awakening, right. and it's a little too close to be like, oh, and by the way, another Zelda. Yeah. So like, wh who's to say? Um, uh, could have been placeholder, it, it, it's a little early, but here's what we walk away from. I think we all believe that Persona 5 is coming to Switch. It's yep. just a matter of when. And we all believe that Metro Prime Trilogy is coming to Switch. So I'm not sure on the last one. It probably will down the road, but maybe it's I can tell you what I would like. Here's, here's my, my, my if, if Link to the Past is coming, this is what I would like it to be. Same game, mm -hmm. top-down, 2D, uh, but complete, but completely remastered in with all new high definition graphics, oh, yeah. orchestral like soundtrack. You know, Ooh. bring it up to date, cool. but keep it true to what the original game was. I like it. I would love that. Sounds, Sounds good rad. to me. I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah. Speaking of Switch games, a very fast news story here from uh, Nathan Onstott over at Game Informer that Nintendo did announce the three new games for Switch Online that are coming in April. And starting on April 10th, the catalog of NES games available as part of Nintendo Switch Online will reach 38. Three new games are joining that service that day. Super Mario Brothers, The Lost Levels. Punch Out, featuring Mr. Dream, and Star Soldier. So I just wanted, that was sort of a uh, fast and straightforward story, but wanted to get it in there. Are you fans of any of those games, Gary? Uh, Lost Level, certainly. I never was a big yeah. um, uh, Punch Out guy. In fact, so the Mr. Dream, I, I only learned about this recently that, you know, because originally it was obviously oh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson and then Mike Tyson had to go away because, you know, rapist and all that. Yeah. And so they, so they bring in, yep. so they brought in Mr. Dream, and I guess they rebooted it and they put Mr. Dream in the Mike Tyson role. Yeah. Exactly, which for me is a kid. I was like, what? Like, whatever, I guess I'll fight this new guy when that was right. the benefit, but... Um, Star Soldier, I don't know. Yeah, it's like a top-down shooter okay. kind of thing. But either way, these are actually pretty solid titles, especially Lost Levels, very hard. Um, so pretty excited about that stuff. But April 10th is so far away, Gary. <laughs> Where would I go if I wanted to know what is coming to mom and grop shops today? The original list of upcoming software across each and every platform as listed by the Kind of Funny Games Daily show hosts each and every weekday. Yeah. Yeah. All I right. Like it. Out today is Borderlands Game of the Year. Oh, it's out today. Okay. Today. Great. That was the that was why they timed it, I think. All right. It's all on right. PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Bow to Blood. Uh, Last Captain Standing, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Shadow Blade Reload on Switch. Uh, Terra Worm. Terra Worm, okay. Yeah. Is on PC. Star Chef Cooking and Restaurant Game. 
That can we, like, can we pull that, that one, sound Kevin? Like a translated I want to see Star uh, Chef. Yeah, give me two seconds. I'll look for it. Star Chef cooking and restaurant. Do you think you're running a, 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 a do you think you're running a restaurant in space or are you like a celebrity <laughs> chef? Which one is it? <laughs> I that's did, why that's I why I need to know the answer. Space. That's why I need to know the I answer. I think it's the way that I said it. It was like Star Chef. But if you say here's in the a thing. World. This is why this is why enunciation is <laughs> so important. If you say Star Chef then it's a I restaurant think it's in space. The, the, if you say the, Star Chef, it's not space. Then he's a, he's a famous chef. Oh, it's not in space. Oh man, Star oh. Chef would have been. That is such a. It's. I'm glad you caught that, Gary, because I was thinking of like Star Lord Chef, and right. I, I've been watching a lot of you know Marvel and Guardians of the Galaxy. This is not quite what I expect. It's a little more on the nose. You know, it, it, it's it's still it's the kind little, of game that I would play. I love these kind of little buildings. Yeah, you're serving tables. Um, it's you know, on theme park type mobile games. already. Yeah, so. but I would have much preferred if it was a space restaurant. Yeah, if you want to relive uh, some of those tough jobs that you had when you were 17. So that's on the you know, PC. The, okay. Yeah, uh, Guide is coming to PC and Super Dent Tennis Blast is coming to PC. So uh, a couple of new dates as well. Brief Battles will stage a battle of the butts on PlayStation 4. Xbox One and PC on May 7th, 2019. Greg prepared this for me. Um, is that real? What is a battle of the butts? I'm I like, what's going on? <laughs> Greg prepared that one. And it's funny, as I very often I looked, I was like, Brief Battles changed to you know May 7th. Great. I didn't read the Battle of the Butts part. So uh, fill me in on that. Well, everybody. I'm wondering if this is Battle of the Butts, brief, is Brief Battles like a game where like underpants uh, are I fighting think it's each an, other? Is that what it is? Is it in space? It is it in space. <laughs> that that's, is the the, that's the question. Uh, another one, Scorcery, will launch exclusively on the PlayStation 4 on April 4th, 2019, just a couple days away. Uh, very quickly, the deals of the day. You want to check these out because pretty solid. This one's big. The Epic Store, which I mentioned before. You can support me, Fran Mirabella, the creator code. Uh, <laughs> I don't get anything for this one, though, because it's free. You can get Oxen free for free. It's free. Uh, that's which a good is game, too. Yep. Head over to uh, epicgames.com slash store right now. I think it's the last day. Uh, you've you've seen it or heard about it or played it? Well, Oxen Free? Yeah. Yeah, I played it. It's fun. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. Then it's Good free. Game. It's normally 20 bucks. That's uh, an amazing Can't beat game. that price. You can't beat it. Uh, also, if you're into streaming and whatnot, uh, like myself, Elgato Stream Deck Controller uh, is on sale for $119.99 at GameStop. Uh, usually it's about $149. So go over there and check that out. So we're going to get into reader mail in just a second. You can write into patreon.com slash kind of funny games as always, where you can get the show ad free as well. Uh, but speaking of ads, this episode of kind of funny games is brought to you by 23 and me. Uh, I want to just point out for starters, I use 23 and me. So I'm going to read through a little bit of uh, this stuff, but I would like to share a couple things about it as well. With 23 and me's health and ancestry service kit, you can explore 125 plus personalized genetic uh, reports that may reveal your link between your DNA and your health traits and more, including your chances of developing certain diseases. 23andMe recently released their newest health report on type 2 diabetes, which tells you your genetic likelihood for developing the disease and gives you personalized results and tools that could help with prevention. Diabetes is growing public health challenge. <clears throat> diabetes is a growing public health challenge. One in three adults in the United States has prediabetes, but 90% of those with prediabetes don't know they have it. Type 2 diabetes is influenced by genetics. It is not just lifestyle and weight. Type 2 diabetes uh, is a condition that typically develops as we get older and is caused by many factors, including diet, lack of proper exercise, weight gain, and our genes. 23andMe's Type 2 Diabetes Report offers insight into your genetic likelihood for developing type 2 diabetes and empowers you with the personalized results and tools that may help you prevent disease. The report was developed by 23andMe scientists using data and insights gathered from more than 2.5 million 23andMe customers who consented to participate in the research. Um, I used it. I saw a note that Greg used it and found out where his ancestors came from. I used it. It was really awesome, actually, to see that breakdown in addition to the fact that I have access now to all these health reports. Where are you from? When and if I want. So I'm actually Italian, Sicilian, uh, as well as French and German. So I'm, I'm like mixed European. But I went in there and found out some interesting stuff. Like one of them was... Um, what was it? It was uh, West Asia and North African was like 5%. And I actually found my grandfather's sister in there. 
um, and she has the same you know DNA in that line. So I'm thinking uh, maybe a little bit uh, that could include Greece or Turkish or Iranian or. But it was some really interesting reports. So you go in and you find out a lot about yourself. I really do recommend it. Uh, the breakdowns are really cool. Uh, the mobile web as well as desktop stuff is really great. So order your 23andMe Health and Ancestry Service Kit at 23andMe.com slash games. That's 23andMe.com slash games. And um, yeah, that's the URL. We got it. All right. So moving on as well. Another sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 25,000 classes in business design and more. Tim used the classes for visual effects to make the hype trailer for Kind of Funny 4.0. So you see the results there. Premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you, whether you want to fuel your curiosity, creativity, or even career. Um, Skillshare is the perfect place to keep you learning and thriving. Highlights from one or more classes, uh, partner found highlights from one or more classes, partner found valuable that would be a good fit. That sentence is a little bit broken. Yeah, that's my bad. But uh, <laughs> highlights from one or more classes that you will find valuable and it's a good fit for your audience. I think it was uh, analysis. Skillshare is also super affordable. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Join more than 7 million creators learning with Skillshare. The first 500 of Kind of Funny subscribers to use the link in the description will get a two month free trial. So head over there quickly. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, let's see, let's move on to a couple quick questions and then wrap today's shows up, uh, show up. Uh, the first one was, do you think that given all of Anthem's issues, this comes from two headed giant, uh, Thank you. do you think that the game studio, uh, that their work environment should reflect the review score? And what Two Headed Giant says is, with Jason's massive and comprehensive report on Anthem and Bioware, I've seen some journalists like Kelly Plague uh, ask if known poor work environments should factor into a game score. What's your take on this? I know that I'm personally torn on it. I want to enjoy quality work by the talented devs and artists, but not if they're killing themselves to make it. Would abstaining from purchasing the game made under such horrible circumstances be a waste of that talent? Or would it be effective to vote with my wallet and not buy something where the work environment is known to be toxic? What do you do? I think it's a really good question. It's a great question. I'm with you. I don't know what to do. At the end of the day, day, when I buy something, I buy it to play it. And so part of me, yes, you have to take into all these political factors. Like if we found out that they, some company employed slave labor, labor and it's an amazing game or you want to play it, all right, now you might have to put, put you know, uh, your money away and not support something that is as vile as that. But in a situation of complicated development, I'm more on the side of like, look, I can't let that factor in. Either I want to play this or not, and it works how it's intended, and like that's it's, it's simple for me to answer on that basis. What about you, Gary? I mean, I think that the situation we're in is the right way to cover it right now. Let's look at Anthem. Anthem came out. People reviewed the game uh, on its face. You know, they reviewed it for what it was um, and didn't necessarily go to any, any broader issue, although they talked about how it did seem to be like the product of um, you know, clearly wasn't finished. There were there were clearly issues with development that were known, um, and people reviewed the game based on what was shipped. But then I think what we also have a uh, responsibility to do is what Jason did and do the follow up reporting and do a separate uh, line of of inquiry into well, why? How did this happen? Mm -hmm. And shine a light on it. So I, I think as long as that is also happening. Uh, I think I think game reviews can be in the business of just reviewing the product on its face, but let's also make sure that when there clearly are issues and there might be a human interest story that needs um, to be reported, let's make sure we do that too. So I think the way that, I think the industry, I, the, so far as Anthem is concerned, I think the system worked. The reviews mm -hmm. came out, they reviewed it honestly, they gave it the score it deserved, uh, which was kind of like a middling middling score, mm -hmm. and then people like Jason come along and also do the the background story and what, why and how did this happen. And yeah. So we, we see we see the full picture. Yeah, and exactly that's where you get more of the full picture. And I, I think that's the better way to put it is let's have this discussion outside of the reviews. Is what I would say is that it shouldn't affect the review and uh, vote certainly just do you want to play it or not. Um, 
but beyond that, we can have a discussion outside of it. This will resonate with a studio. It has certainly already gained traction. We're talking about in today's show. So there's a time and a place for that stuff too. Um, and if it gets that bad, yeah, maybe you need things like petitions and, and ongoing discussions about these problems. Obviously there's discussion should developers unionize and all that stuff, but right. uh, longer discussion for later. Uh, I mean, I, what's interesting about it is the end result is what matters, right? If Anthem had come out and, and, had, and had just as much of a human toll, yeah. but the game had been perfect and it was 98% reviews and everyone was doing great, EA would think this is great. Nothing needs to change. In fact, one of the uh, one of the one of the interesting articles about uh, the, one of the interesting we didn't talk about in the Anthem article was how they talked about some of the developers at Bioware had wished that the most recent Dragon Age game had yeah. flopped because it would because it would have it would have it would have taught them that trying so this is not hard way and worries to make games. Is not the right way. But but, it, but this, this happened. Dra- the the yeah. most recent Dragon Age it was Inquisition. I can't remember. Yeah, twenty fourteen came out was super popular. But it, again, there was a lot of there was, was a lot of there was a lot of bodies left it. by the roadside in yeah. the development of that game. But critically. Uh, claimed because it was critically acclaimed that's all the ea we sold a lot yeah. of copies we did great we, what do we need to change yeah but when something so, comes out like anthem or, or they have like the loot box fiasco with with battlefront 2 yeah that w- but, when the end result is not good only then will a company like ea say well shit maybe we need to change yeah and, th- and that's what i put i've been covering games for a very long time and like it wouldn't have mattered if dragon inquisition flopped it doesn't change the culture of a studio based purely on that you're always willing to find your other explanations for why something is good or bad and it's not it, making games is hard as bioware it's itself did say, and I think that was the most accurate part of what they said. It is super tough. You said it yourself. Working on these big projects, uh, vision or not, is still, it's chaotic and it's creative and it's difficult. And um, sometimes, yeah, you you run into tough situations like this. Uh, now, very fast squad up comes in from Gilly Brums on PS4. The username is Bright Shadow. We'll leave it in the, you know, the comments description, so make sure to find it there. But that's BR1. G-H-T, bright with a one in it, dash shadow, bright shadow. Um, and he says, uh, he didn't say he what says he nothing. wants to play, but uh, he check just out Gilly Brums. To, he guess he uh, can play anything on He'll PlayStation play anything. 4. Message him. Uh, that's a great best friend right there. He's down to play anything. All right, so on the next few days of the show, uh, we're not going to have Gary anymore, unfortunately. I've had an awesome time. But tomorrow is Greg and Andrea, and then I'll be back for Fran Friday uh, and hopefully can read coherent sentences. Uh, Andrea and I will be on. So it's the Frandria show. Frandria, Fran I love it. I'm trying. But uh, Gary, <laughs> it has been a pleasure, man. So much news today. We've bucked the trend, so I think we have to do this. This is the again. first time that we've actually gone over our hour because we just had so much stuff That's to right. talk about. Yeah, I know, man. It's It's been an amazing show. So thank you, all the best friends, for tuning wrong. in. Huh? Did you do your wrong? We didn't do your wrong. I thought you might be cutting it. Oh, we geez, over. that's right. We can do it. Uh, I, 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 didn't I, think I, we I assume you might be wrong. cutting it because we were running over. Uh, do we have right any of your wrongs? Yeah, 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 it's right here. Um, nah, you guys are great. You're doing a great job. I'm proud of you guys. That, <laughs> let me double check. Good call. I think I always skip your wrong. I'm good at that. You always skip your wrong? Well, I have, we all make mistakes I have a memory school. of Kevin reminding me. Okay, so, uh, wow, we have... A bunch of write-ins. I hope these are actually wrong because it's making it very hard to read. <laughs> oh my goodness! <clears throat> mm. All right, uh, the you're wrong on the on Real Engine f- four game. So Vault gets thirty percent cut. Epic takes a five percent cut on Epic Store for the same game. Epic takes a twelve percent. Okay, so I was about right. So of the engine, they're talking about how Epic takes a 5% cut if you're on the engine. I think that's what this is saying. Okay. Whereas on the store, Epic is taking 12%. So it is huge difference. Uh, thank Got you it. for okay. writing in. Hopefully that is accurate. Um, what else did we see in here that we might have been wrong on? Uh, oh, um, and by the way, that came in from, I should have credited who that came in from, was Lord of Pwn. Thank you very much, Lord of Pwn. And then also from Barrett, the clown. <laughs> it's actually Pedo Clown. Anyway, uh, Bioware confirmed they didn't read Jason Schreier's article in full before the tweet went out, apparently. So they confirmed it. And Kebabs is confirming the Metroid Prime 3 was on the Wii, and the trilogy was also on the Wii as well. Uh, so we got that part right. Okay. And. Well, I did. Oh, wow. Because yeah. you said it was on the GameCube. I said it was on the Wii. No, no, no. I, I was saying the first Metroid oh, was okay. on it. 
But on that note, uh, I said 2003. By the way, I reviewed it then. And you're right, I was off by a month and a half. It was November 17th, 2002, the end of 2002. Okay. Um, when that came out. And by the way, it should have got Game of the Year. A lot of people had awarded Battlefield 1942 that year, Game of the Year. Oh, well, you have a good memory but, for that. Uh, well, it was a very important year for me. And let's see if there's anything else. Uh, just making sure. Uh, somebody saying nanobiologists is like the areas in your genetics report also include Morocco. True. It might be part Moroccan. More to find out. Interesting. All right. Uh, yep. I think we caught everything. All right. We did good. Nothing too, nothing too bad. Nothing too bad, but I'm actually, I'm actually pissed that I got Metroid Prime's release date. Right. I know, I mean, but if, that's, that, if that's the worst thing, for like a month and a half on a release date, I'll take it. Exactly. Well, it has been a pleasure, best friends. And Gary, it has been more of a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Let's do it again. Until next time, best friends. We'll see you.